Welcome to uh, Numerical Methods. And we are in a new chapter. Yeah, So we started discussing the Monte Carlo method. Uh, I gave you a motivation. Yeah, we, we had a nice introduction, the definition, and we had the uh, convergence rate. And today I like to discuss Monte Carlo integration. Yeah, so with a little lemma, we see that actually what's here is an integration method, calculate numerically integrals. So let's maybe start with a small uh, recap of our previous sessions on the Monte Carlo method. So the first thing we uh, recalled was, okay, we need uh, drawings of a random variable, samplings of a random variable. So actually what is a drawing of a random variable, how is this modeled? And this is already a good thing to, to recall this because if you go back, you see what it is, is you create the product space. On this product space, you create a sequence of IID random variables. So a sequence of random variables having the same distribution. So N IID random variables as your random variable X. And on this random variable, you consider then a single event, yeah, a single event omega. Yeah, also on this sequence, you consider a single event omega. And this represents then the drawings of your original random variable X. Yeah? So your X of omega I is actually the X tilde of a single event omega tilde, where the X tilde is now this uh, sequence here. So we have um, a sequence of IID random variables having the same distribution as our uh, original random variable X. Uh, and this corresponds then to the modeling of these drawings. Yeah, why was this relevant? Because all our convergence results were formulated in terms of these sequences. So we have a sequence of IID random variables, and then we can prove, for example, convergence. Convergence now for our Monte Carlo approximation. So this here is our Monte Carlo approximation, one divided by n, take the sum over xi, and this converges to the expectation of x. Well, on the left-hand side is a random variable. Yeah, it converges in uh, the sense of probability. So it is only p almost surely. Yeah, so in probability, it converges. Um, so that was just that we had some convergence. And the nice thing that was that we could derive from Chebyshev inequality. So this here is Chebyshev inequality, uh, which we have for a single, uh, single random variable uh, that we could derive from Chebyshev inequality if we just plug in for this random variable, our Monte Carlo approximation, that we have a um, convergence rate say a nice um, error bound. Yeah? So if we plug this in and move to the uh, complementary event, yeah. so instead of the larger or equal epsilon, I have I would like to have a smaller epsilon, then uh, I get that the distance of my Monte Carlo approximation to the true expectation is less than, okay, there is, the sigma here, yeah, the square root of the variance of um, x, and then there is a constant square root of delta, but more important, yeah, there is a square root of n here, so we will divide by the square root of n. So if we make n larger, yeah, this distance becomes smaller and smaller, we have convergence order square root, uh, one divided by square root of n. Uh, unfortunately, we had this only with a certain probability. Okay, so the probability that this is the case is large or equal one minus delta. We can make delta small, yeah, we can make the probability high, but you see that this affects here the uh, 
quality yeah, of my uh, yeah, error, error bound. Uh, and this uh, left us a little bit disappointed because um, we have this result in probability. But what we are actually doing in applications is that we plug in here into this uh, Monte Carlo sum. We plug in here a single omega in the sense that we consider a drawing. So we consider a single sequence sampling, yeah, which means if we go back to the interpretation, what does it mean to have a drawing, uh, which means that on our product space, we observe a single event. Yeah, and something in probability doesn't tell me anything about the single event. Yeah, it's a pointwise, we use it pointwise, but our convergence estimate is only probability. Uh, nevertheless, um, the method is already useful. Yeah, we could think, okay, just repeat Yeah, the um, procedure with different events. So try to, to sample your approximation over and over. Uh, but later also we see that uh, we can fix this. And what we also see yeah, uh, shortly is that this probabilistic nature is really uh, something very useful. Okay, uh, we are now in a section on Monte Carlo integration. So the bridge to Monte Carlo integration is here this little lemma. So if I have a sequence of IID random variables, Xi, then taking a function and applying it to the sequence, I get a sequence of new random variables, say Zi, and this is also IID. Okay. Um, so why is this now the bridge to uh, integration? Just apply this and replace here the xi with zi, because zi is also a sequence that um, is iid. So all my previous convergence results, all my results uh, are valid for the sequence zi. Yeah, if we do this, then I'm actually averaging the function here. So I have one divided by n, take the sum i from one to n, f of xi. And if you now plug in a single event, yeah, so if you plug in here a single event on the left-hand side, so you plug in omega, so then this means that you calculate here one divided by n, i from one to n f of little xi, uh, and the little xi's are just the x evaluated, the xi's evaluated on the single event. So this is a sequence of random numbers. Yeah, So just evaluate your function on a sequence of random numbers. And this converges to the expectation of z, yeah, but z was just f of X. So this is the expectation of f of x1, say, all have the same distribution. And now take as a special case, take a sequence that has uniform distribution on 0, 1. Yeah, then I know the density. The density is just dx. Huh? So the density is just 1 dx. The density is just 1. So my integral is, uh, my expectation is just integrate from zero to one f of x one dx. So I see that what we have is a method that can approximate the integral of an arbitrary function. Yeah, I have an integration method. And really the nice thing, yeah, we started Monte Carlo, uh, yeah, the Monte Carlo chapter by the remark that it's very versatile, very easy to implement. Just take the function and then just take a uniform distributed random sequence and average the evaluations. And if you are not happy with the result, continue, continue. It converges, it becomes more and more uh, accurate. So there is very little structure in, in this method. Before I will 
define the Monte Carlo integral. And actually, we will, we will define it uh, a little bit more general, and there will be a little surprise yeah, in our small motivation. Before I define the Monte Carlo integral, uh, let me just discuss a classical integration rule. Yeah, so. Um, like a Riemann sum uh, and um, explore this a little bit because then I can compare the properties uh, may, maybe a little bit better and you will see why the Monte Carlo method has really an advantage yeah, over such a classical integration rule if we move to high dimensions. So I would like to discuss the Simpsons rule. So here is the Simpsons rule. given a function f and I have an interval from a to b, I would like to approximate the integral from a to b f of x dx. Yeah, then this can be approximated by um, b minus a divided by six. So that here is your domain divided by six, and then it's f of a, so the left endpoint, f of b, the right endpoint, and four times the middle point. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, how many functions do uh, evaluations you have? Okay, uh, technically speaking, there are three function evaluations, but the middle one comes with a weight of four. Yeah, so I have four times the middle one, one, one. So I have six function evaluations. So you are averaging these six function evaluations and you multiply them with the size of the domain. That looks reasonable. Um, this scheme here, yeah, so to have a one here, a one here, a four here, yeah. This scheme has a nice property because we get then a very good uh, error estimate. If you think, for example, um, Riemann sum, yeah, where you just have a single point uh, in the middle, yeah, then you are sensitive to a change in the slope, yeah, because then you get this triangle. Uh, if you have a trapezoidal rule, yeah, where you have just the endpoints, which is actually just a single point more if you have a discretization, uh, then yeah, you you are uh, you don't have an error if you have a linear function, but you have an error if you have a quadratic function, yeah, because you get this bow. Uh, so you are uh, sensitive to uh, the second order, and actually here we use an additional middle point, and since we use this special weightening scheme, we can eliminate yeah, by some symmetry another derivative, and we are only sensitive to the fourth order. Uh, so we get as a remainder in the Taylor series, yeah, when you like to prove this, that we have a very nice um, error estimate. So our error, so the difference between the true integral and my approximation is less or equal one divided by 90. And then we have B minus A half to the power of five times the fourth derivative of the function at yeah, some point C. Um, I would like to now improve uh, the integral uh, by adding more and more points. So I would like to discretize my interval now say for example in m sub intervals and i can create a, a better approximation by reusing this role here on every sub interval yeah actually since i have a middle point here yeah i will always use two intervals to do this uh, to get not so confused with the letters uh, i use now a, a new letter or two new symbols for my interval. I would like to discretize now my interval from C to D into M intervals, and I would like to apply this rule. Okay, so this looks like that. So I have an interval from C to D. Yeah, uh, Let's say I use 10 intervals. So C is X0, D is X10, and in between, yeah, it's an um, equidistant partitioning of the interval. And then 
I use, say, the first three points, x0, x1, and x2, and I then use the Simpsons rule to approximate the partial integral yeah, on, on these first two um, intervals. So this means I have one times the function evaluation in x0, four times the function evaluation of x1, one times the function evaluation applied to x2. Um, I can repeat this with the next two intervals. So you see, I need an even number of intervals to apply my scheme here. No? So I have an even number of intervals. So I have one function evaluation in x2, four function evaluations in x3, and one function evaluation in x4 to approximate the next partial integral over these two intervals. Okay, so this means if I now combine, if I take the sum over all those partial integrals, yeah, then I have one function evaluation here in the starting point, and then it's four function evaluation at a point with an odd index, yeah, x1, x3, and it is two function evaluations at a point with an even index, x2 yeah, and x4. So I get actually this scheme. So you have always four, two, four, two, and so on, except for the endpoint, there is only one function evaluation. So if I now use this, I get the composite Simpson's rule, yeah, where I have a, a partitioning of my interval, I have more function evaluations, but the approximation becomes more accurate. So this composite Simpson's rule now looks like that. So I have my integral, integral from c to d f of x dx, which I would like to um, approximate. Huh? And what is the sum over all those Simpson's rule approximations? Yeah, it is one function evaluation in x0, say, say from the first partial Simpson's rule. It is one function evaluation at the last point, say in xm, okay? And then it is always four on the points that have an odd index. So since I use m plus one, evaluation points. So we have m plus one evaluation points, m plus one because I go from zero to xm. I have m intervals. Uh, let's say the interval size, yeah, the interval size is called h. Yeah, so h is d minus c divided by m. Yeah? So then my Simpson's rule always, always takes two such intervals. So the size here is 2h. Um, so since I have m such intervals, but I use always two, my sum runs here from j equals one to m half. Uh, and then I use here the odd index. Uh, and I, of course, I also have the points with the even index so the f of x to j, where j now also runs from one to m half. Well, actually m half minus one, yeah, because you see this is here, these are the inner guys and my x zero, yeah, is, would correspond to the even set, but is actually uh, the special point that has one end in, in the end. So you get this, uh, this summation. So this, sum here just corresponds to summing up all these partial Simpsons rules. Yeah? One, four, two, four, two, four, two, and in the end, reader, four, one. Um, what happens here to our factor? Well, this here was the size of the interval. B minus A you know, is the size of the interval. Um, my B minus A here is actually the 2h. So I get as a b minus a, I get a 
h divided by three. Okay, so and now how does my error estimate look? Yeah, of course, I mean, you can plug in here the sum over these partial integrals, yeah, and estimate it just by the sum of the errors. So my error was a b minus a half to the power of five times the force derivative and a factor one divided by 90. Uh, my b minus a divided by two is actually just the h. So I get an h here, uh, but now I sum over all those errors. Uh, so what I will need is that the sum over a b minus a half, yeah, this is actually the d minus c half. Yeah? So this is the sum over all intervals, okay, the sum over all intervals yeah, will get you a d minus c half. So with this d minus c half here, maybe I take a different color, a d minus c half, this becomes here a d minus c, and then instead of divided by 90, divided by 180, okay? The other b minus a half, yeah? so I take out of the b minus a half to the power of five, I take one out, yeah? I sum over it to get the whole, um, yeah, whole domain. Uh, the others are just b minus a half to the power of four, yeah, and this is just my h to the power of four. So here we get my h to the power of four, which is a very nice, very nice um, error estimate. So you see, if you take m intervals, yeah, uh, you your h is actually order one divided by m. So you see that you have convergence rate order one divided by m to the power of four. Yeah. We use m plus one points yeah, because we need odd points, even number of intervals. So this is approximately the number of points yeah, uh, to the power of minus four, yeah? one divided by the number of points to the power of four. So this is eight yeah, to the power of eight better than what Monte Carlo does. Monte Carlo does one divided by n to the power of one half yeah? square root. So this method here converges much, much faster. This is due to the fact that we have a very special structure yeah we have a very special structure we have a very special choice of these coefficients and if you like to change the number of points yeah maybe you have to completely recreate your structure completely recreate your all your um, evaluations yeah so we have also disadvantages there uh, here is um, an implementation of the simpsons rule yeah so you see we have here the even points. We have here the odd points, which we sum up. And we have also additional here, the two endpoints. And this implementation here is maybe a bit fancy. It uses the Java streams, yeah, which we can maybe discuss uh, separately. And maybe it's much nicer to have just a classical implementation without the streams stuff. Let's play a little bit with the computer and implement this method. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a new package here. My package is now uh, Monte Carlo Integration 1D. And what I would like to do if I now implement this, uh, I would like to make the design maybe a little bit cleaner. Let's first define um, an interface. And this interface is called integrator 1D. And this interface should 
describe what a numerical integration method can achieve. So the numerical integration method uh, gives me just a single function, a function that allows me to integrate a, a function. Okay, so my function to integrate a function needs as a first argument, yeah, the integrand. And then I have two other arguments, say the lower bound and the upper bound. So now I have to find an interface and integrators, the Monte Carlo integrator, the Simpsons, with the Riemann sum, you can play a little bit with this, should all yeah, implement this interface. They should provide uh, an implementation to this uh, method. Yeah? So now let's create our Simpsons integrator 1D, yeah? maybe a classical one, and it should implement this interface so it should implement my integrator 1D interface. So now he complains, yeah? he complains there's something missing. There is an unimplemented method. I have to implement this method yeah, to complete the definition of the class. Yeah, okay, so there is a stop here. Yeah, We have to work on this. Okay, there is a question in the chat. The double unary operator is just a function that maps a double, a floating point number to a floating point number. You can just click on this open the definition and you see it is just an interface that specifies there should be a function that maps an argument to a value. That's it. So that's my f of x. Maybe we should provide a documentation to our interface. So one should provide a documentation here. So there's Java doc. Yeah. So and this is approximates the integral of a given function f from A to B, yeah? uh, and this here is then the function F, the bound A, the bound B, and what it returns is the integral. Uh, and if you like to write LaTeX, you can write LaTeX, if you like, from A to B, F of X, DX. So this is now what my class yeah, should implement. Before we now implement this method, uh, what are the properties of my Simpsons integrator? Uh, yeah, what do I need to construct it? Well, if you look back in the formula, it is an equipartitioning of my interval. The interval is given here as an argument uh, into sub-intervals with a certain structure. So I need actually the number of points, the number of evaluation points I would like to use. So my property, my field here, is the number of evaluation points. So I need a constructor to create this class here, and I'm a bit, a bit lazy here, and the IDE can help me to generate the constructor for this field. So you see, I can now construct an object of this class by passing the number of evaluation points and the number of evaluation points will be stored here in this field. So now I have everything at hand to implement the method. Okay, so um, the number of evaluation points needs to be odd. Yeah? I have also the endpoint to have an even number of intervals because the number of intervals needs to be even. Maybe we check this here, yeah, it's maybe good practice. So if number of evaluation points modulus two yeah, is uh, equal to zero or is not equal to one. So if we are not odd, uh, then we throw, uh, say an illegal, illegal argument exception with a certain message, yeah, so message should be number of iteration points needs to be odd. So now I can be sure that the number is odd, yeah, so um, how many intervals do I have? So I have number of evaluation points minus one intervals, ah, okay, maybe I should also check above that the number of evaluation points is not zero. Okay, can do that later. Yeah, these are now the intervals here in my Simpsons rule. Yeah, so these are now these small intervals here. However, if I take the sum, yeah, it makes maybe sense to combine 
always the two pairs yeah, to use the double size intervals. Um, yeah, the number of double size intervals, yeah, this is number of intervals divided by two. So now uh, I loop over all these double intervals. And I calculate this integral, yeah? So I calculate the sum, yeah? And maybe let's just call the sum now um, integral. Like I'm, I'm summing up now these guys. Uh, well, there is a little tricky thing. Uh, well, these are now here my double size intervals, yeah? So I would like to take these two points here, yeah? Then I take these two points here, these two points here, these two points here and so on. And then I also have take, to take the last point, yeah, because the number of points is odd. Uh, I have one additional point. But you see the first double size interval is a little bit different from the other ones. The other ones always go two, four, two, four. Uh, so it's maybe better to exclude this one here and have a special treatment for it. Uh, you can also include it and then subtract the evaluation at X zero again. That would be another option, but maybe I exclude it. So I run here from one. So now I sum up all these evaluations and this is two, four, two, four. So the integral is summed up. So I have two times the evaluation at the even index. So the evaluation at the even index. So the first guy is X2. Uh, so this is now my function evaluation. Where's my function? My function is the integrand evaluated at. Okay, evaluated at. Yeah, now I need my discretization. So for this, I need my step size. So my domain is D minus C. So my domain is upper bound minus lower bound and my integral step is domain divided by the number of intervals. Yeah? So actually this guy here is the H yeah, in the theorem. So I have the lower bound, my starting point plus I, yeah, but now always the easy even index two times i times h. So check, yeah, if i is equal to one, yeah, so this here is actually the x2. The x2 is 2h from the starting point, yeah, 2h. Okay, so that is the guys with the coefficient two. Then I just add the guys with the coefficient four. Yeah, so this is four times the odd points. And the odd points are now starting in three. So it looks like this, two times i plus one. Yeah, And maybe I make it a bit nicer so we have everything aligned here. So this is now adding all these inner points. What's missing is the first and the second point and the last one. So I just add to the integral, I add the first one. So this is my integrand evaluated at the lower bound. I need also at the lower bound plus a single edge. Yeah, so that's x1. And that's the last one is at the upper bound. Okay, so I hope that's it. Yeah. So we calculated the integral, mm, not yet. Have a look. We calculated now all these sums here. Yeah, one, one, yeah, and then four and two. Uh, I need to multiply with h divided by three, right? I calculated all these sums and I need now the integral 
multiplied with my integral step times h divided by three. Actually, maybe you think why it is now three. Yeah? I had such a nice explanation that we had a six here, yeah, because we have six pseudo function evaluations, one plus four plus one. And why is it now um, actually a three here? Well, you see that the average of four and two is actually three, yeah? So for all these guys here, two, four, two, four, yeah? You need to divide by three. And then you have two intervals with a one, a four, and a one, yeah? So this is in sum six, yeah? You have, but you have two intervals. It's also a three per interval, yeah? So you have, in average, yeah, three function evaluations per um, interval, per interval H. This should be the implementation of our Simpsons integration rule. Maybe I test it, yeah? Maybe I make a new package and call this uh, experiment, experiments, and I do the test here in this separate uh, package. Maybe we have here a class, and this is integrator 1D experiment. I would like to have a main method, and I would like to test this, yeah. I would like to integrate a function with my integrator. So let's define the integrator. So my Simpsons integrator 1D is now defined here. So new Simpsons integrator 1D, say with a few evaluation points, let's take 1001 evaluation points needs to be odd. And then I define the function. Yeah, which function do we like to integrate? I have say, let's take the cosine. Yeah, so we take the cosine x maps to cosine x. Yeah, why is the cosine not nice? Because then I knew, I know the analytical integral. So the integral analytic, this is x maps to the sine of x. Um, let's define a lower bound and an upper bound for my integral. So let's integrate, say, from 0 to, say, 5. And we now compare the analytic solution uh, and the numerical solution. So the integral value analytic, this is, yeah, evaluate at the upper bound minus evaluate at the lower bound. And my Simpsons integrator, yeah, this is, I you have my integrator, integrate my integrand from the lower bound to the upper bound. Let's print maybe the error. Okay, let's calculate here the error. The error is the integral value of the Simpsons minus the integral value analytic and we print the error. And let's run this. Okay, so this error looks quite good. Could also print the value. Uh, so we get almost minus one. Yeah, maybe we continue. And then when we define the Monte Carlo method, I will do the same stuff again and uh, implement such an algorithm for the Monte Carlo method. Yeah, but here you have your Simpsons integrator. You see, yeah, it is already a bit involved yeah, to, to implement this guy. So that was the Simpsons rule. Important aspect is now what happens if you generalize this to higher dimensions. And if you have a one-dimensional integration rule, you can straightforwardly um, generalize it to a cube by, say, defining the iterative integrals. So for example, if this here is your interval from A to B, and this here is your interval from A to B, 
in the second coordinate, yeah, and you would now like to integrate a function that is defined here on this, uh, whoops, this cube. Yeah, then you can create a Simpsons rule. So I have to use for the Simpsons rule an odd number of points, an even number of intervals, yeah? And then it always goes four, two, four, yeah? So what I can use is now four, two, four, one. So my Simpsons rule would look like that. So then I can use this to calculate the integral over the coordinate x1 for any given fixed x2. Yeah? So this gives me now an evaluation of the integral for a fixed x2. And now you do this with a discretization in the other direction. Yeah. So now I do a discretization also in the other direction which gives me now all those integral slices. And now I use a Simpsons rule again on these slices. So that's one times this, four times this, two times this. Oh, I, I count, I miscounted, I, I missed one. Yeah, so it's this one that I missed. Yeah, now it looks better two times this and one times this. So I have one, two, three, four, five points in the horizontal dimension multiplied with five. So I have five times five, uh, I have 25 points. So you see that the number of sample points grows exponentially in the dimension. Now, this is the classical way how you pull such a method to higher dimensions, yeah, by, by defining the integral, the one-dimensional integral for fixed other component, and then integrate one component out, yeah, and then do that by component, by coordinate, by uh, dimension, one after the other, and always have these one-dimensional integrals. Due to this Cartesian structure, yeah, you get an exponential growth in the number of required uh, sample points. So if I do that, and if you remember that I had order one divided by n to the power of four uh, approximation error for the one-dimensional Simpson's rule, yeah, now you get due to this guy here, this exponent to the power of d, that you have an one divided by n to the power of four divided by d. So you see that this method gets worse if the dimension gets high. Huh? And starting with eight, yeah, we, we're getting worse as uh, compared to the one half from the Monte Carlo. But we still have to check what Monte Carlo is doing in higher dimensions. Okay, so keep this in mind. So now you have a classical integration rule. You have seen a classical integration rule and you know this uh, so-called curse of dimensionality.